And we're live! Welcome to the Hayamoto and Julian Coding Podcast! I'm Hayamoto. And I'm Julian. And today that we're going to be talking about fundamentals through the lens of GML. Uh, something that I think both of us have seen a lot is... Uh, there are a lot of videos about how to do stuff in GML, but there's not a lot of like coding videos that speak to uh, learning programming through uh, GameMaker Studio. So we kind of want to talk about programming fundamentals through the lens of using GML. And uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of it. I had a <laughs> that's my, that's my intro. What do you got to add, Julian? Well. Um... The thing is, what we see a lot is people asking, like, how to use an array, what is a list, what is a stack, what is a queue, what is a map, why do I want to use a map, why do I want to lose, use a list, what's the difference? Um, Especially when they seem to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so we thought today we're going to do a longer um, episode to, again, talk about the fundamentals being algorithms and data structures, because those are really important. I'd argue one of the most important things, which oh, is yeah. uh, why we're going to talk about them. Hell yeah. So let's just move right on over to the uh, to the pen pad here real quick. And, uh, and I want to start off with, obviously, the most fundamental thing that we could do is we can say... Uh, my variable is equal to 3. And in this case, 3 is what's known, at least in GameMaker, as a real. Now, this is kind of deceptive because, in truth, there are two different number types. There's integers, which are all whole numbers, so 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And then you have floats. And there are some technical stuff about this in the program, but you can pretty much ignore it because it's just going to handle it on its own. But a float is a number like 1.23 or 33.17529, etc. And so those are your basic number types. And then, of course, the one that everybody uh, knows is going to be, well, hopefully you've learned at this point, is going to be your strings. And those are when you put characters. And something that you'll see a lot about data types right here is this encapsulation method. When, you, when we're talking about a string in this case, it has a name. It's called a string literal. It means it's <laughs> literally a string. And GameMaker Studio has a couple other literal types. We have arrays. Oops. And, uh, <clears throat> and we have structs. Sorry about that. And that's your curly brackets. I actually did that in Python. I apologize. The uh, but what I don't I, now, granted, hopefully you've seen these, maybe you've heard about them. But let's talk about what these actually are. What is an array, Julia? What is an array? An array is um, a data structure that holds elements in a finite amount of space not in game maker but uh per definition that's what an array is. well even in game maker it works that way now game maker does a couple little clever things that's not worth discussing mm -hmm. right now but when it comes down to it the big the key word is that an array is a contiguous block of memory and so when i say i want an array with 10 elements the computer will go out and it will oops, i'm going to do this in a slightly easier to draw way the computer will go out, and it will actually reserve that memory. And you can think about an array as being like a chest of drawers. You might have a drawer somewhere in your house, and it has different drawers for you to store stuff in. And when we look at it, we could say, this is drawer number... <laughs> actually, let's talk about this real quick. In computer science, Everything starts at zero. So if you ever wondered why everybody's like, array zero, this is drawer zero. It's not drawer one. Sorry, the sooner you learn that, the better off you're going to be. But that's drawer zero. This is drawer one. And finally, we have drawer two. Now, arrays work the exact same way. When I'm asking for something in memory, I say, hey, what's in drawer 
number one. And it's going to be whatever you put inside of it. So we have our array, and as uh, Julian said, they're made up of elements. So we have our elements in our array. And this becomes your drawers. Here's drawer zero, here's drawer one, there's drawer two. And in now, the interesting part about arrays is that uh, they're super fast. And why is that? Is because when I say I want uh, drawer nine, well, it's just a math problem. It's, it's array zero plus nine. So I get over here. Everything in memory, in this case, is sequential. So when I want to look up something, I don't have to count. I can just do math. I can just say, hey, give me element number nine of that array, and boom, it's right there. But what's the drawback of arrays, uh, Julian? I mean, they're, they're a fundamental data type, so when I say drawback, oh, I'm not good. saying the bad part, but I am saying there are a lot of data types for a reason. So what's the drawback of an array? Well, for one, um, as I mentioned, it's not exactly obvious in GameMaker, but if you want to resize your array... If you're thinking about the analogy with the drawer, uh, you will have to add another drawer cabinet because um, you can't stuff. Well, you probably can, but um, it's impractical. You can't really stuff a fourth drawer into a drawer cabinet that was only supposed to hold three drawers. So uh, if you want to resize your array, you have to add more drawers to it. And in this case, it's more memory. Like yes. Reserve memory. And just like our cabinet, it was built with a number of drawers in it. So if I need more drawers, I have to get a new cabinet. And that's exactly what happens in memory. If I have my array right here and I say, hey, that's not big enough. It doesn't hold everything I want. I have to ask the program to give me a new array of the new size. And then it's going to copy over everything that I had in my array to the new elements. And this is the problem with arrays in terms of their limitation, is that while they're super fast to access, if you have a size of items that you know, uh, this is how many I want, you create an array of that size, super fast. But when you're not sure what the size of it is, it's going to be much slower to add and remove elements from that array because it has to be resized. The same way it would go if I said, hey, I don't want drawer number three anymore. I have to build a new drawer or a new set of drawers that does not have a three in there. And so you might ask, you know, well, that seems kind of inconvenient. Surely we've solved this problem in, uh, <laughs> in computers. You know, they've been around for a while. There's got to be a way that you can you know, resize the array without having to request a whole new block of, without moving essentially? And the answer is yes. We have another data type, which is called a list. And the list works a little bit differently. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of the list, when you want to uh, add something to it, it's basically like, I guess a pile of boxes, if you want to call it that. And I have a box right here. And so this is my list. And this list is going to contain, or sorry, if I want to add something to this list, I say, okay, give me another box. Now, something you'll notice here is these two boxes are not uh, connected. And that's because what we have to do is instead of putting them all in a, in a row in memory, we simply point to that next box in the list. Now, there's a limitation to this. In fact, when I only have two boxes, we wouldn't consider this to be too big of an issue. But if I have a lot of boxes and I say, hey, what's in box number four? You can't just go and find box number four. This could be anywhere in memory. We don't know where it is. And so what we have to do is starting here, we have to say, hey, where's box one? Where's box two? Where's box three? Where's box four? Mm -hmm. Boom, we found box four. So here's my value. And if you're, and if you're hopefully keeping up and this all is making sense to you, you'll see that the cool thing about lists is, is if you wanted to add another box in the middle of your boxes, you could easily just change which box they point to. And then suddenly, I have my new box in there. So lists are super easy to resize. They're, they're very easy to add elements to. They're very easy to remove elements to. The place where they falter is that it's slower to look up. There is a caveat to that. Of course, there's caveats to everything. Lists can be optimized because if I know that I read one last 
then I know my next one is, or if I read zero last, I know one is going to be my next one. If I read one last, my next one is going to be two. And so lists can be as fast as arrays as long as you read in sequential order. That's a key component. <clears throat> but when you are talking about getting random results from the uh, boxes, like, oh, I want to get from two, and I want to get from zero, I want to get from one, I want to get from two then it's much slower because it has to start at zero every time to find your to find your data. Now, this isn't such a huge issue when there's only two items in the list, but if you had a list with 100 items or 1,000 items or 10,000 items, you can see how it starts to slow down. That might be worth the trade-off if you intend to iterate over it sequentially, but otherwise you might be looking for a different solution. The last one I want to talk about here is uh, is structs in a way, um, but not necessarily structs because uh, GMS weirdly enough has two data types that do the exact same thing. That's weird, right? Is that weird, Julian? Um, uh, hash tables. Uh, yes, they are hash okay. tables. So in GML we have structs, which we declare with our struct literal, or we can use our constructors, but we also have maps. And those are the whole DS map create, etc. The funny part about this is, is they are the same exact data type. The only reason we have two of them is because later on when they added structs, you know, but honestly, there's no reason to use a map anymore. There's no performance enhancement to it. It's not better in any way, shape, or form. That I can tell. I've seen some performance benchmarks from it, and people seem to say that they are the same exact speed, so I'm willing to believe that. But it makes sense, because... We were talking about uh, the difficulty of uh, looking through that list, right? And let's say you had 10,000 items in your list. Let's pick a big number like that. And the fact, and you wanted to find, you know, I'm looking for what the, like let's say you have a, a database of items and you're like, I want to find what the value of an iron sword is. And, and so you're like, well, where is that sword in my array? Oh no, and we're going to get back to this later, so don't you worry. But for now, I would have to look at every element in that array to try and figure out which item was my iron sword, just so I could get its price. Well, hash tables are an interesting little idea, because what they say is, what if instead of doing that, we put iron sword into an algorithm, which Julian's going to talk about next, and out came a number. Well, in this case, we could then use an array. And I could say, okay, iron sword is zero. So I'm going to put my iron sword right there. Now, because iron sword will always spit out this zero, I know that zero is always going to be my iron sword. That means my lookup time is all, well, is, is instantaneous because I don't have to search across this entire array trying to figure out where the iron sword is. Instead, I can just feed it into this hashing algorithm and I get a number out and then I can look that up in there. Hash tables are a little bit more complicated than this, but when it comes down to it, that is really what it or that's really the fundamental uh, nature of them. But like all the other data types that we've talked about so far, they also have a limitation. Julia, do you remember what that limitation is? Uh, you do not want to, you can, but you do not want to loop over a hash table for a lot of reasons. That's a good, that's a good, good, good one. It's very hard to iterate over a hash table because what order are the entries even in? Like we have this table, and in my example, you know, the table was uh, so large. Uh, hash tables will dynamically resize as you add more elements. That's all technical stuff that uh, is implemented by the people who made them. But what it comes down to is this might contain something, this might contain something, this might contain something. But you'll notice one and two are empty. So when we're iterating over this table, the other thing is, is what is zero? There's no way to know what zero is. We can't say, oh, zero was iron sword because we can't convert zero back into the name that it came out of. We can only go one direction. And so what happens is, and in Game Maker, this is what it does, it'll actually store a list of all of the names that have been put in the, in the, in the hash table. And that's, when you ask for that list of names in the hash table, that's what's happening, is Game Maker has just kept track of this information in a list, and then it's going to spit that back out to you. 
And uh, so hash tables uh, have very fast lookup, but they're incredibly bad at iterating over. So they don't make good lists and they don't make good arrays. Sorry, what were you going to say, Julian? Uh, the other problem is that this hashing function you mentioned can be very complex at times and mm -hmm. and expensive. Uh, we will not talk about hashing functions now because they're uh, like really complex and mm -hmm. the big topic on their own. But the problem with hashing functions is, as you mentioned, we cannot take the number and convert it back to the element. So we can't say, oh, well, it's zero, so it's got to be an iron sword. Because the problem is an iron sword must... Like, um, the problem is we cannot tell which number it will be without knowing the number beforehand. And at that point, we run into issues because uh, the hash table is an unsorted data structure. Uh, sorting is another topic, but when which you we'll add get to, to the array at, at index zero, it's always going to be at index zero, but th it's going to be the first element you added. So it's always going to be the first element you call when you call from index zero. But when you call from a hash table, you cannot guarantee, even if you have that underlying array, that the element at index zero is going to be the first element. Yeah, you have no idea. In fact, the hash table, you then have to look everything up as well. So it's very slow to iterate over compared to an array, where all you're doing is looking at zero, then one, then two. Hell, it's slower than a list because, as I said, as long as you're going sequentially in the list, you're still going to get similar performance. But... Let's get it. Let's now. Let's bring it back to games real quick. And what are some good use cases for a hash table? Um, it really depends on how you're building it, but uh, something like an inventory can be a good use case for a hash table. Depending if you wanted to know, like, how many apples you had, for example, mm -hmm. you could you could make a hash table where you're like, you know, apples, and uh, yeah, and that'll then when you look up apples now. Uh, I didn't mention this before. There is another interesting little characteristic of a hash table is because when you look it up, if that if that item is not in the hash, sorry, you know it's not in the table. Mm. So while it's not a great, uh, it's not great for a sortable inventory. If you have a game where, like for example, you're collecting uh, items in a way that the player doesn't necessarily need to interact with, yeah, a hash table could be a great idea. Databases is a really good one. If you have a lot of uh, uh, data that you need to use, you can look it up very quickly. Something I used it for in the past uh, for Nyan Ru was uh, localization. Uh, what you do oh, is yeah, when yeah. you're asking to draw the string, you just write in the key and it will look it up in the table. Well, because the table, because the hash function always returns the same location, you can just change the language that's in the hash table and you'll get the, the, uh, the translated game. So, you know, those are hash tables. Uh, interestingly enough, I would argue that hash tables are probably one of the more advanced data types that once you find uses for them, they're amazing. But if you just go looking for uses for them, you'll often find out they didn't work super well. So let so arrays, what would you recommend an array for other than everything? Um, <laughs> in 3D graphics, a mesh, for example. Oh, yes, yes, certainly. Well, that's a little complex. I, I can't think of anything either right now. Uh, something that I use arrays a lot for is to pass in multiple arguments uh, in a single variable. Mm, yeah, yeah, that works. It's kind of like instead of handing somebody something that was in drawer zero, I just hand you the whole set of drawers. And I go, hey, look, drawer zero contains the position. Drawer one contains, you know, the Y position and, and uh, drawer... Two uh, contains the draw mode. So yeah, you can pass in a lot of... Now, why you would want to do that varies, but it's usually when you have a lot of complex data you want to pass into something, but and you need the other arguments to represent other features. Uh, a statically sized inventory, definitely uh, a great way of, of storing that because if you're like, look, zero is bullets and... or Sorry, actually, let me take that back. Uh, statically sized inventory is you can make, let's say, every element in your array, you say, you know, zero means it's empty. Well, you can iterate over that array. You can find an empty slot and you can fill it up. And if you can't find an empty slot, you say, hey, this array is full. Uh, with a list, you can kind of do that, but um, but arrays make it very uh very immediate and understandable how that's working. Anytime you have random data, arrays are going to work well. And lists. When would you use a list? 
All lists are amazing for game dev. Something like um, how many entities your bullet collided with to calculate how much damage it dealt to every one of them. Oh yeah, uh, and lists are nice because uh, you sort them, and uh, and you might you could like sort them by distance, and then you're like, hey, the bullet can penetrate through three enemies, and so you can literally just count how many enemies you've been through this list, and boom, you know, why make it any more complex than that? Uh, lists are also really good anytime you have a data structure that's going to change frequently. If you're try, if you, uh, like, let's say you have a list of enemies, and the player attacks, and one of the enemies dies, it's much easier to remove it from a list, uh, than it would be to remove it from the array, because, again, you have to resize the array, but, uh, so, yeah, lists are, <laughs> and, and something else I'd like to bring up is, uh, you know, like a list is a very literal term. It didn't get named accidentally. Uh, anytime you need a list of something, you can probably use a list. And arrays and lists are very old data types. They're probably one of the very first data types that was made after literal integers and such. Um, okay, so yeah, so we talked about that, and and so yeah, and, and Julian, he's uh, he was going to talk a bit just about like what algorithms are. What is an algorithm? Yeah. Before, I just want to mention there's other kinds of data structures you will hear about, for example, sets or something that's called a dictionary. Um, I recommend to learn them, just look them up. We can't talk about all possible data structures <laughs> here because there's... A and we're not going to. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand the fundamentals and to understand what a data structure is used for and useful for, and it's useful for algorithms too. Um, we will talk about something called big O notation later. Uh, so keep that in mind. So get um, excited for that. Yeah, but that will follow right after algorithms because it's useful for all the things. Um, well, to understand what an algorithm even is, we should probably define what an algorithm is. And in, in I think in eighth grade, my maths teacher said it's something you run and when you run it or like execute it and do the same steps over and over again, you ideally get the same result and you always expect the same result for the same state well, we talked about states so um you know yes what state is. that's the key word i want to emphasize is for the same yes. state even if you have a pro uh, an algorithm that returns a random number for example if it went in with the same random state you would get the same random number exactly and to maybe make that a little easier to understand think of an algorithm of like baking a cake you can bake a cake in a lot of ways as you will find out now and uh, i hope you don't forget that um arguably the least efficient way to bake a cake is to take all the things you can do to bake a cake let's say just the ingredients for now you make a list of everything you have in your house to bake a cake that will include everything you can use to cook everything that is edible ranging <laughs> from pickles to uh whatever celery now, uh, you, as the human, know that doesn't belong in the cake, but uh, your algorithm doesn't know it doesn't belong in the cake, and I will touch on that in a second. But um, the most primitive algorithm is arguably a brute force algorithm, because what it will do is it will try every single combination of ingredients and, well, uh, then try out if it's a viable cake. and. Until you either run out of ingredients or it, or you run out of time, I guess. Or patience, or um, probably taste salts. Um, You're right. I'm not eating another bad cake. The point is, um, you are going to try every single combination, and that's bad because, well, kind of constituting a cake is easy. It's something to be sweet, and well, um, it, it like has to have flour, and so the more advanced way of brute forcing something is called a greedy algorithm, mm -hmm. uh, which basically takes all the things that you know are viable or like that would make sense in this context and removes the things that wouldn't make sense. Because, you know, when you're baking a New York cheesecake, you know you're not going to use pickles. So you can remove pickles from the list of possible ingredients. And then you do the same thing. You just try everything again. It's still not efficient, but it's better. Yes. And... Greedy algorithms are interesting because they're all about trying to find the closest answer. So, for example, let's, if we took our uh, the little cake example there, we can um, we can say the reason it ignores pickles is not because they're necessarily off the list, but because it's the least optimal thing to try. 
And uh, gre yeah, because greedy algorithms are all about the name. It's actually in the name. It's always reaching for the highest value item, and then it goes to the next highest value item and the next highest. So if it was trying to make a cake, it might grab a bunch of sugar and a bunch of eggs and a bunch of flour. So it may not get you a cake, uh, but it'll at least get you close to the ingredients that are in a cake. Uh, but yes, keep going. Uh, you might argue now that um, since those are, I, I've made fun of them a lot now, um, they're so bad. Um, well, why would I use them in the first place? Actually, there's some use cases and very important use cases, namely being uh, cryptography, where uh, you don't know the password of the user you're trying to hack or... Um, well, <laughs> and all you can do I'm is just try like, every combination. Yeah, I would, I would go with a more ethical um, idea, but I don't have any other ideas right now. So the user you're trying to hack, you don't know their <laughs> password at all. So you will have to probably try every single combination. Um, and that's it. There's not much more you can do. You can try with password tables. And if the password is in that password table, congrats, congratulations, you've used a greedy algorithm. It's yes. Still not good. Yes, it's a greedy better. algorithm would be to try all the passwords that are in a, in the most used passwords list on the on the planet first because, you know, again, even if it didn't get it right, it's going to get you a lot closer than you would have before. Um, yeah, and so algorithms... Uh, if we in big O notation, which we'll move into real, uh, now, is uh, could be considered the O in big O because O stands for operation. Now, uh, I don't know if it's a common misconception, but I think it's easy to confuse. Is big O notation is not about um, time; it's about cycles. An operation. Let's just you know use a number. An operation takes one second. Well, in a logarithmic, or sorry, when a uh, in a linear uh, algorithm, <clears throat> it would take o times the number of uh, operations you had to do, so, or I mean, times the time. So, uh, in this case, if you had to do a hundred operations at one second, it takes a hundred seconds. So that's a linear algorithm. The, I, <laughs> we'll move into this a little bit uh, afterwards. And so, when we're talking about optimization, because we talked briefly on this before. You can optimize two sides of that algorithm. You can optimize the speed of the operation, or you can optimize the number of times you do that operation. And as an example I had given to Julian earlier was, <clears throat> let's say that I have an operation that takes 10 seconds, and I find a way to make it only take eight seconds. Holy crap, that's a pretty good savings right there. But here's the funny part. If I have to do that operation 100 times, I look, I saved a little bit of time, but let's say I find a way to only do it seven times. Wow, I have saved so much more time than that two seconds. And this was an, ex you know, that's an extreme example. Two seconds is probably worth saving. But at the same time, in the broad scheme of things, I've saved literal minutes as opposed to a handful, you know, 30 seconds off of the top of this other one. So when we talk about big O notation, uh, it's very interesting. It's actually very simple uh, when you get down to it. There are, <laughs> there could technically be more than this, but these are the uh, the basic ones. And so from, I'm missing the actual fastest one, which is O1, which means it takes one operation to do no matter what. Hash tables are O1 lookups. So from <laughs> from fastest to slowest, we have logarithmic or logarithmic, which uh, basically means that the more operations that you have to do, the higher the savings are. Linear, which means that uh, it's it's linear. The number of operations you do, it goes up linear with the amount of time it takes. N log N is your next best one, which it it doesn't necessarily... It's not like O log N where it gets faster the more operations you do. It's still going to be slower. But if we move on to our next one, which is exponential, O N log N is leagues faster than exponential. Because you've heard exponential before. Exponential means it, it's always going to go up equal to the number of times or uh, squared for whatever it was that you had. So if you wanted to do four operations... O in square is it means it's going to take, or sorry, four things to do, it's going to take 16. If it was uh, 12, it's up to 144. O n log n, on the other hand, is still around like 46. I'm not going to do the math right here, but it's it's much lower. In the case of uh, like 100 operations, it ends up being like 2. It's very low. 
and then factorial. Now, believe it or not, these these are not just here as precautionary ta tales. These are all viable algorithms for different reasons, but we are trying to get here when we can. Or more specifically, we're always trying to shift to the left if we can. And so factorial means... Uh, uh, so factorial is like factorial of 10 is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. It's, these numbers get ridiculous really fast. Your, your cheesecake brute force algorithm would be factorial, for example. Because yes, it, it. yeah, it's just it gets out of hand very, very quickly. And so in order to kind of illustrate these, uh, we, uh, we're going to bring up two very simple topics, which uh, basically exist in this space over here, which is uh, searching. Because we talked about uh, we talked about our arrays and we talked about our lists and we talked about our uh, hash tables, which from now I'm just going to call dictionary. And we have our dictionaries. And uh, and so wh what's the search time in a uh, in a dictionary? In a dictionary, um, if you're searching for value at a key, it's O, and, uh, it's o of 1. Yep, it's O of 1. And that's really the benefit is because when we look at O of 1, it means it's constant time. No matter how many entries are in that dictionary, it's always going to take one operation to look it up. It's a kind of expensive operation due to hashing and stuff like that, but overall it's very fast. Uh, <clears throat> for arrays and lists, however, well... The most naive version of search, and sometimes you can't get away from this, and that's what we're going to talk about, is what's known as simple search. So what is simple search, Julian? Uh, you basically, and I'll, I'll get to something else in a second, you basically look through every element and see if that is the element you're looking for. And now you might argue, well, if the element is in the first place, um, the lookup time is very fast. Go one, two. Um, but it might be in the last place, so it's O of N again, and that's kind of where big O notation comes in again. Big O notation refers to the slowest possible time. Ah, yes, thank you very um, much, yeah. Other too. I think big theta and something else, I forgot. Um, but big O notation always means the slowest. So the you slowest said, what time. if it was at the front? So what happens if I search from the back? What if I want to get clever and I say, oh, I'm going to search from the back just in case it happens to be there? At the same time, right? Yeah. Now you're being... So, yeah, we end up with the same problem. Because now if it's at the front, it took all those entries to go. And it would be the equivalent of picking up a... Dic uh, we'll say a dictionary. And you said, I want to find goat in the dictionary. And you start at page one. And you look at A. And then Anne. And then Apple. And then Alligator. And you go through the whole dictionary till you find it. That would be pretty darn slow. Uh... As... Uh, well, this might be confusing because you just referred to hash tables as dictionaries, but uh, <laughs> it's a literal dictionary. Fair enough. Yes, a literal word dictionary. Yeah, perhaps I should have said like a telephone book, but I don't think those exist anymore. The uh... <laughs> Let's say your cookbook. Yeah, when we're looking for a recipe, I want to find my recipe. I have to look at every page to find it. Well, sometimes that is the best you can do, which is uh, which is sad, but it's where something like uh, binary search comes in. Now, binary search is very clever. It's how you might actually find something. Let's go back to our cookbook example. I want to find a souffle. So I flip to the middle of the book, and I see that I'm at key lime pie. And I'm like, all right, that's too low. So I flip halfway uh, up the book again, and I check there. And I find, oh, I'm at quiche. And I'm like, oh, I've gone too far. So now, or no, sorry, I'm still too low. So I go forwards another half, and now I'm at zebra cake. And so I'm like, all right, I got to go back. As I do this, I'm going to get closer and closer to finding my souffle and what page it's on. And what you might say out the gate is like, you know, that still seems like a lot of work. But when it comes down to it, uh, a, a, <laughs> a cookbook with 100 recipes in it will only take about seven or eight of these searches for me to find that page. But if I started at the front of the book, I have to go through almost all 100 recipes to get to souffle. And that's where we get into these time savings. And this is uh, something that I wanted to put in here because I find it very fascinating, is we talked about random insertion and random sorting. Because as long as you're doing a linear uh, 
read across data, the list and the arrays are fine. It's when you're doing it randomly that's slow. Well, the same way goes for search. If your items are in your array or your list in a random order, you can't do a binary search because it's random. You don't know where anything is. The only possible way to find something in there is to literally look at every element. And that's a very common case. Uh, you know, in your RPG, your player has an unsorted inventory. So if you want to find out, you know, where the, the mystic key is in that inventory, all you can do is look over the entire inventory. There are ways to improve this other than just doing that, but sometimes you just have to do a simple search, but you can make things easier on yourself if you search for, or I mean, if you have an ordered list, because then you can start to use um, these other search methods, like a binary search. And again, we go from, in the case of a 100-page cookbook, we went down from searching potentially 100 pages to searching potentially, uh, I forget what log 10 is or what log 100 would be. I think that's... I don't know either. Um, I don't know why I'm forgetting it right now. It's 10 times 10, so it would be one, but it's not one operation, so I forget. I forget what I'm... I'm forgetting something right now. But yeah. I'm going to do it anyway. Um... It's about uh, seven operations, but I, anyways, go ahead. Um, well, now you might ask, well, binary search is so clever and well, I'm not clever. Maybe, um, how do I come up with a system that makes more sense? Like how do I come up with a better program? And this is a big topic. Um, it's it, like binary search is actually a dynamic programming problem where you split the, um, the original problem up into a smaller set of problems you try to solve first and in I the think case you're of thinking of sorting right now binary search is not a dynamic no, programming I'm problem sure, i'm pretty sure binary search it might be anyway sorry C keep going uh, dynamic pro programming is very loosely defined anyway so um, <laughs> uh, the main the main takeaway is you want to separate your problem um, into smaller sub problems you can solve easier and then you take those smaller sub problems and like the intersection of those and you, you put them all together in a very fun way and then you get your solution would you call um, a smaller part of the problem another algorithm uh yes exactly and uh, what i was going to get at is um in the case of searching um it's especially important to understand the uh, importance of data structures because for binary searching actually you will find that there's a data structure called binary search tree um, and binary search trees are vital for uh, binary searching and without binary search trees you wouldn't have binary searches and well what i'm getting at is that you need to understand data structures to understand your algorithm and if you understand your data structures and your algorithm you can improve those uh, because again as Ayamoto said if you can take down the runtime by two seconds that's fine but if you can take the cycles um that are going to be executed like off of your uh, like code like the times it has to run that's going to be bigger savings in the long run than just reducing the cost of a single operation and to be able to understand that you really need to understand data structures so for when you when you're searching for something if you can please go for a hash table it's going to be much more efficient Oh, yeah. And so we'll move back over here real quick. And so we're going to talk about sorting a little bit in a second, but I do want to talk about the searching real quick. Let's provide a visual aid for the people who are watching rather than listening. But what we were saying is if we have, and we're just going to use an array in this example. If I have, excuse me, my array, and my sword is here. Then I have to check each and every one of these in order to do that. And that would be my simple search. And again, simple search is very common. It's sometimes it's just what you have to do. But what I was getting at with the binary search is if my array is in order and my sword is here, then what I can do is I can check here and I might find my fidget spinner. And I know that that's too low. And so then I take half again. And oh goodness, I've already made it to my sword. In two steps, I made it to my sword in my array. Instead, it took seven over here, it took two over here. And that's the magic of, uh, <laughs> of searching. Is, but I only get that if I have my ordered uh, 
I have my ordered array. It, everything has to be in order. And uh, I, kind of interesting. Talk, Sorry, go. I think if you're going to talk about that, it will make more sense to use numbers instead of items, maybe. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> alphabetically. Good point. Yes. The, uh, yeah. I don't know. I've always found those examples to be really weird. But yes, I get exactly what Julian's saying. Is, I mean, really, when we get down to it, let's just say that we do have numbers. And here's my ordered list. And I wanted to find the number five. Well, I can take half of my uh, size here and I can go to three. And I can go, well, three is less than six. So now I'm going to, or sorry, three is less than five. So then I take halfway again between these two. I jump over here. Boom, I found five. And five is equal to five, so I know where it is. Now, this is a very practical example because it's very unlikely that you would be storing an ordered, <laughs> an ordered array like this. But let's let's use a slightly different uh, numeric set here just to sort of hammer this point home. Let's say I have three, nine, 14, 27, 30, uh, 48, and 90. Again, I know how many elements that I have, which is still going to be the 7. So I'm going to search in the middle here, and let's just say I want to find 30 in this case. So I'm going to go with my 27. Well, 27 is too low. So the next one, so I have it again. I go up here. I'm at 48. Okay, well, that's too high. So now I go back again. Boom, I found my 30. And again, we have three operations, as opposed to, again, if I did my simple search, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So something you'll see a lot with big O notation is best case or sorry average case and worst case so in this case uh, simple searches worst case is o n its best case is o one for binary search its uh, best case is or its worst case is log n and its best case is o one if the very first one we looked at was <laughs> was correct uh, sorry I said best case again the average case however for Binary search is still O log N, whereas the uh, average case for uh, simple search is still O N. So you can see that even though it seems like you'd be like, hey, but sometimes it could be right here at the beginning. The funny part is, is with my simple search, this is still two operations. Well, this was two operations as well. So I still beat it out in terms of the average case. Um, yeah, I'm going to interject again here. Do it. Um, you said binary, uh, not binary, simple search is average case O N. Um, well, someone might think, um, well, is it's it actually O-N log one N? half. <laughs> and it might be one half N because N could be like on average N will be at half. But um, as far as I know, you just reduce like that component because it is irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. Well, and it's always going to be the number of operations, so you've you've already reduced it down. Its best case is O1 because that's the lowest it can possibly be, but its average case is the same as its worst case. Uh, and you have the same average case and worst case for binary search as well, but with the benefit of it's faster. Now, again, I stress, you only get that if it's ordered. But uh, to kind of tie this together to where we're going here... Is so we have our data structures, we have our arrays. Well, what's the big number one thing that you want to do with a list of data? You want to search it. Where is carrots? Do I have a radish? You know, if this is uh, my shopping cart, I have a list of things that I need to buy and I need to know if it's in my cart. Well, I check my list, I check my cart. Is it in the cart? When I'm doing a simple search, that would be as if I were to pick up every single item in that cart and go, is this milk? <laughs> is this milk a radish? No. Is this can of beans a radish? No. Is this bacon a radish? No. Binary search is more like me looking at the cart, moving some stuff aside, being like, it's not there, moving some stuff aside, it's not there, moving some stuff. Oh, there's my radish. And it's, uh, but search is a very fundamental concept. There's a secondary fundamental concept that's a bit harder to understand, uh, but it's, sorting because as i said you can only do the advanced sort or the advanced searches when you've sorted it so sorting becomes a fundamental principle of programming once you understand your data types you're searching and you're sorting you kind of have most of the tools you need to build almost everything in uh in games even if you don't even if you don't realize it yeah. yet so talk to me about the uh the the dirty word bubble sort Oh, actually, the dirty word is bogo sort. Um, 
Um, okay, the, the uh, dirtier Jimmy. word. Let's just talk about bubble sort, though. <laughs> uh, to explain that joke real quick, um, bubble sort is basically you take a list, you randomize it, and you check if that list is randomized. <laughs> Um, now the astute observer will notice the um, like big O or BOGO sort is O n factorial and <laughs> to quickly explain another concept it's O n factorial and not O n factorial plus n because you need to check if it's in order um, because the largest factor will dominate um, the runtime. Yeah, that'll the be the smallest part of your runtime is checking if it was right. <laughs> going to be O n factorial because it doesn't matter if it's O n if it's O n factorial. It will be o, o factorial or O n factorial plus O n, but still, it, yeah. I mean, but that'll be such an inconsequential amount of your time. That's that's um, the, like another thing to understanding optimization. Um, but bubble sort is basically you go through every element and compare it to the next element. Is it larger? Is it smaller? If it's um, if you sorting by uh, order ascending um then if it's it's if it's larger um you swap them and well now you compare again is it larger or smaller than the than the next element and you do that a lot and i don't know the runtime in my head but i know it's awful um do you know the runtime in your head uh it's o n squared it's uh it's okay. exponential yeah, it's because you have to compare every element in your array to every other element in your array. And so you say, A, uh, hey, is, uh, is 5 greater than 0? And then you go, OK, I'm going to swap them. So now I have my 0, 9, 5, 3. And then I still have, but I still have to keep going. <laughs> is my 5 greater than 3? OK, no. So I have to check it across every one. Then I do my 9. I do the same thing. Is 9 greater than 5? Yes, it is. So I'm going to swap them. Might actually be doing an optimized sort just because I'm so used to doing it. But but then we check against our three. We have our O five nine three and it, or I'm sorry, three. Messed up, you silly man. Nine, and then again we have to continue. So now we have to check our three. Okay, it's not greater than zero, or, or it's greater than zero. Okay, it's less than five. So then we have to swap them again. You can see how we're doing a lot of swaps. I don't have a great image for this. But yeah, it's 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 an exponential sort. And the funny thing about bubble sort, or at least what makes me laugh, is uh, if you ever want to not get hired, give bubble sort as your answer to a problem. Because it's really sad, but bubble sort is like, it's like showing up to the job interview with crayons. It's just, uh, it's the simplest, most easy to understand sort, and yet it's so pitifully bad next to the next best sort uh that it, because okay you go from uh we talked about this before but bubble sort is right here <laughs> do you know what the, hey julian what's the next best sort we can use um well there's a lot of better options i'd say quick sort merge yes sort and what is quick sort um i will admit i don't I have quick sort in my head right now, which is shameful for a programmer, but I believe <laughs> go through the list and I, I think it's a random index you choose. And that is yes. called the And for the pivot, um then I forgot what is happening. I, I know merge sort because merge sort is better than quick sort in my opinion. So uh you can take from here. And a lot of people they do like their uh their let me see here. I actually have this answer right next to me, so I was going to try to find it quickly. But, uh, yeah, it's. I believe it's, uh, yeah. So in its best and average case, so I was correct. <laughs> Do you know, <laughs> quicksort is log n on, its, on both its best and its average case. Its worst case is o n log n. And so that's how big of a jump it is between bubble sort and quick sort is we didn't just go down here. We didn't just go down here. We literally went to the only thing that's faster than linear time. And so, yeah, this is how bad bubble sort is. It could only be worse as if it was, if it was factorial. So unfortunately, that's why I make that joke that if you don't want to get hired for a job, say bubble sort, because you were literally picking the worst algorithm that you can pick to sort a list. 
It doesn't matter what job, by the way. If you're applying for retail, if you say bubble sort. Yeah, you know, yeah. Even if, even if you're applying for a retail job, it's still going to be. Now, uh, it's going to be a little bit beyond the scope here to to talk about exactly how to implement these sorting algorithms. And and look, I, I'll be honest with you. This is one of these things where where I do want to kind of give out terminology and uh, and that way people know what to search for. You know, we talk about big O notation, we talk about quick sort, we talk about merge sort. And, uh, and there's a lot of different reasons why you might choose any one of these. But the real key thing here is knowing how to do at least some of them. Um, every, every programmer honestly should be able to do a few sorting and a few searching algorithms just off the top of their head. Even if it's bubble sort, and even if it's simple search, it's you got to know how to do it. You really do. Once yeah, you get into the more advanced ones, you'll love it. You'll you'll truly love it. Now, I will do a quick plug here because I just read this book. This isn't an advertisement. I'm not getting paid. But this is uh, Grokking Algorithms, an illustrated guide for programmers and other curious people. And I, I would actually encourage you, if you're really sitting there and you're like, oh, God, I want to learn more about programming. I want to get these fundamentals under my belt. Like, But I feel like tutorials and stuff just don't really cover it. As somebody who hates most programming books, I actually found this one to be pretty agreeable. It, it's, uh, it is illustrated. It, it tries to demonstrate most of its concepts in a very visual way. Um, it uses Python as its example language, but Python is actually very easy to convert into GML if you <laughs> understand the, the tools there. But they are very similar in a lot of ways. And, uh, and yeah, so it's just it's important to know how to search. So I guess for the sake of just completion here, uh, when we're talking about merge sort, I, because we talked, to, we didn't talk about this too much, but Julian did allude to it. There's something called divide and conquer. And the idea is, is that a big problem, like how do I sort this array of a thousand elements that are in random order? That's a big problem. But what's an easier problem? Sorting an array of 50 elements. Well, what's an easier problem than that? Sorting an array of 25 elements. And again, 12 elements and six elements and three elements and two elements. What's the easiest array to sort? Julian, do you know this one? I bet you do. What's the easiest size of array to one. sort? One. Well, it's, technically, it's I'd one. Say zero. Mm. One is, yeah, one or zero. That's the easiest array you can possibly sort. But if you can get it down to an array size of two, that's pretty easy because then you just swap them. And so the way mer that uh, merge sort works is it basically breaks the array up into a bunch of smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller groups using recursion, which <laughs> we'll, we'll do that in another video. Uh, but it basically breaks the problem up in these smaller and smaller and smaller arrays until they get down to size two. And then it checks, hey, are you bigger than this one? And then it swaps them. And then so when it comes time to sort that array of size three, it's very easy to do because you have one array that's sorted and then you have another then you have another number. So is that number larger than the biggest element or is it smaller than the smaller element? That's what order you put it in. Then you get to array size number four and you do it again. And you just keep going up and up and up. And uh, merge sort, I believe, is n log n. I believe. Yeah, it's n log n. That's why people and, and like quicksort so cases. much is because quicksort on its average case, if you have a good pivot, is uh, log n. But I believe merge sort is, is n log n in its average case. Um, but still a very good sort. Uh, it's much faster than doing a bubble sort by a lot. If you have an, if you have an array of uh, 100 elements uh, with, uh, with merge sort, it ends up being like 17. I've, you know, I should have done the math beforehand, and I'll, I'm just really bad at my logarithm logarithm math. But it's it ends up being like 10, 17, some number like that. But for bubble sort, it's a thousand. So, or is it 10,000? I think it's 10,000. So yeah, you could just see the difference between those two, even though they're adjacent to each other on the list. Even though we've said like, hey, this is right here and this is right here. The difference between these two as they grow larger and larger is extreme and very quickly. Uh, yeah, it allows it. And I mean, hey, look, if I was to offer a good reason to pursue it, the faster your search and the faster your sort is, the faster, uh, I mean, the larger data set you can work with. Uh, Game Maker Studio is notorious uh, for having slow loops and uh, probably mostly because I say that every time I have a chance. But 
the fact of the matter is is that loops are slow just in general. It's just that GML's loops are s slow at a much lower number <laughs> than what you have in other programs. And, uh, and so if you can speed up your search and your sort, you can work with bigger data sets much more easily. Uh, something that I would add to that is if we look at our list, it's much easier to add a new element sorted to a list than it is to an array. So ooh, maybe we choose a list for our data type instead because we can add new elements already sorted. And then when it comes time to search, we can, make, we can leverage that binary search and get a much faster uh, outcome than we would otherwise. Uh, in FAST, I'm writing a thing called iterable list. And it has a feature that you can tell it that the elements should be added in order. And if you do that, it actually runs about four times as fast on average. Uh, than it would in an unsorted array, which goes to show that it's pretty fast to begin with. But uh, And that's just with uh, 100 elements, I believe. If you went up to 1,000 or 10,000, you would see <laughs> much more significant improvements. And that's because you save a little bit of work doing a quick search and insert than you would doing a f <laughs> than you would doing a fucking slow sort or slow search later on. Excuse my, my, my swearing. I get excited. All right. YouTube kids content anymore. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's no longer for children. Darn it. Um, to kind of like, uh, since I was talking about algorithms, to kind of talk that and like um, circle back. To circle around. Come on, do it. Um, a while ago, I was, I was um, doing a challenge for a national programming competition, and they had this very interesting problem where you had three containers of beavers, I think. Uh, now, this sounds silly, and it absolutely is silly. They often the are. Was, it was something like um, you have the beavers in your container and the number, and when you do a specific operation on two containers, you take the difference between the containers and put it in the smaller container. So when one had five and the other two, and you did the operation, um, now the other one had five and the other had two. And the task was to find the long, uh, I think, I think it was the shortest, actually, to find the <laughs> shortest way um, to, to... No, it was the longest. It was find the longest way that isn't infinite. Um, sure, to do that has a solution. Yes, to, to do a set of operations that ends up in one container of three being empty. And, well, this is a difficult problem. Um, it, it sounds far easier than it actually is, um, but the way we ended up solving it and... Um, what we previously did, previously we just brute forced it. It's possible, and we just brute forced it. I think we actually greedy forced it because there were few rules to it um, that we could leverage, but that was a really bad way. And so we sat down, and what we did is we ended up like writing things down, like we made a little network of operations. And uh, what we did end up finding out is you can map these out like a graph, and when you like connect them up to each other, um, it ended up being a craft traversal problem instead of like a container problem where you had to force your solution. So what my advice really is, um, maybe don't take your problem too literally, like write it down and maybe you'll find some similarities to other problems that have already been solved because craft traversal has absolutely been solved. It's one of the most fundamental things to learn. About. We didn't talk about it here, but maybe we'll do that yeah. in a future one. So, so like the main piece of advice is again don't take your problems too literally write them down and think about them with a little patience because the best solution is going to come to mind immediately <laughs> and and uh, that's a good point like you know i bring up this screen here and it, i don't have it just for this when i'm working through problems a lot of times i'm doodling on that to actually show the different ideas something that i find a lot when i'm helping people is they're like, oh, I want my code to do this. And I, you know, my first question is kind of like, well, is that what your code says? You know, like do all the features. And, and I know that sounds funny or maybe like I'm picking on somebody, but the question is, is, you know, if you have a series of rules that you need your code to obey, you have, a, you have an outcome that you want and it's based on criteria. The question is, is does your code include all of that criteria? Uh, my favorite comment now is, is uh, recently been coding is deterministic. That one, one that makes it kind of easy to do because you know what will happen. But two, it means that nothing happens that you didn't tell it to, <laughs> or at least it shouldn't. Otherwise, that's a bug. The, uh, that's the standard part of programming. 
Yes. And and so once you kind of understand that deterministic nature of it, you can write things down in a deterministic way. Here are my rules. It You know, like, let's say I want to add an item to an inventory. It's not just me pushing it into a list somewhere. That would be, you know, that's the most naive approach possible. The real approach is, is that I'm like, does my inventory have room? Is Do I already have another item of the same type that this can combine with? Um, uh I guess that's kind of the only two I can think of off the top of my head. It's, it's going to be a more impressive series of rules. But there's two rules right there. And so the question that I have to then look at my code is, does my code contain those rules? In order to make it contain those rules, I have to search. I have to go, does, you know, is there enough room in my inventory? Okay, is the inventory size less than some number? If it is, cool, I can add the, or, you know, I can proceed. The second one is, does my uh, inventory already contain an item like this? that I could add it to, like maybe it's a potion. I don't want to have 90 of the same potion. I want to combine it with another one. So now I have to do a search on my inventory. Does my inventory contain this item? And if it does, I say, okay, add one to that item. If not, then add that one to the list. And so now we see my rules have been expressed in a, uh, in a more fundamental way. I have met all of my goalposts. And later on, if I decide, you know, uh, the type of backpack that I have, like it can only carry ice items. And so, you know, it's like, why is it taking non ice items? Well, that rule's not established in my code. I didn't, I didn't write that into that. So yeah, I, I guess that's kind of our takeaway. This was our, another long one for us because we were all passionate. And we wanted to talk about it. Got any closing thoughts, J uh, Julian? I've feels like you gave some pretty good closing thoughts already. Yes, um, since you mentioned uh, like looking through the list for all items you can combine with the size, I think next time we're probably going to talk about caching. <laughs> Julian so. has been wanting to talk about caching. He loves this shit. Ah, I, I ruined it for the kids again. Darn it. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to have to bleep myself. Uh, yeah, and then my closing thoughts there were, yeah, if you understand your fundamental data types, uh, and then you... And, and you're sorting and searching. Those really are the basics of, of what you need to get this, these sorts of things done. Like in that inventory example, yes, it was just tacked on there in the end, but you can see how it was like I needed to know my data type, which you know was gonna be a list or an array, whatever it happened to be. And then I needed to know how to search it because that was how I was gonna find out whether or not something was already in there. And uh, so, you know, stay happy and keep coding. <laughs> this has been Julian and Hayamoto's coding podcast. We were talking about some uh, fundamentals through the lens of GML. And uh, I guess we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye-bye.